Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, Henri Bergson. We are in um, video, it's not video six, but it's like the sixth episode. Can I call it that? The sixth topic, let's say that. Uh, perception, that's what we're looking at today. So this one is, uh, it's a, this is all from uh, Matter and Memory. And this is such an important part of Bergson's philosophy and such a, um, a, a really important idea. Um, when I first finally, when I first got into Matter and Memory, this just, it's, it's one of those ideas of Bergson's, um, <clears throat> there are a few of them, that it's just, it, it's so insightful um, and once but once you get your head around it, it it seems like it's so obviously true but um but yeah it's uh this is just just what Bergson is for me he's just so he's, he was just so on the money just his insights were so clear um into the way that you know we we perceive and we uh, experience the world and and the metaphysical structure what life is it's just so onto it anyway enough rambling let's get into perception right so what is perception first um uh, a couple of kind of preliminary thoughts bergson talks in this in, in matter of memory, actually, in terms of images rather than um, objects and uh, mental representations, everything is just treated as images. So he's just kind of blank slating everything um, and, and just calling everything, whether it's something out there in the real world, external to us, it's an image, whether it's something we imagine or something that we um, we perceive, a perception that we have. We, we typically think of that as a mental representation of the world. Those are also images. So we're going to use that word uh, throughout here. And that just gives us a nice, well, you'll see actually how the effect that that has. So everything is is an image. Very simply put, it's just like a picture. That's all. So if you can just think of the, um, think in terms of images, then uh, that'll help. So realism, he talks about realism first. Realism starts from the images of science, right? So you've got a whole structure built up around these images, which are described um, in terms of science, described in the, in the, vocabulary and in the con conceptual structures of science. Idealism, on the other hand, was the opposite, starts from images of perception. So one is um, starting from the outside, the things that are out there, and that's science, that's realism, and the other is starting from inside, so the, the images in our heads, if you like. And, and working out to what's out there in reality. The problem is that then if you start with this kind of duality from the very beginning, neither can explain the other. Realism can't, it can't um, account for the pictures, the images in your mind, and idealism can't account for the images or the objects in the external world. So this is the problem of dualism. However, <clears throat> even though realism and idealism are completely um, at opposites, there are two similarities that Bergson points out. First, both treat perception as a veridical hallucination. And that, so this is an interesting idea. Um, and what, what he means is that the states of the subject are just projected outside him or herself. So whatever's, I mean, it, we can't say that there's anything out there. It's, it's all a hallucination, but kind of a true hallucination. So if you think about in terms of, of realism, there's uh, the images that we have, that we, that we construct in our head are 
images of those things out there. So there's still, it's a, it's a hallucination. We're creating something um, which is not real, even in realism, right? Even though that's supposedly based on real things around us, real things out there. And idealism obviously is, is constituting reality. So the images in our head, again, not real, a hallucination, but they are, they are what the world is. So both of them, both of these um, viewpoints treat perception as, as kind of not real, just as a, as a hallucination, something we are kind of fabricating for ourselves. And another similarity, both assume perception is purely speculative, centered on pure knowledge. So to perceive means to know. This is such a great insight of Bergson's. Um, the assumption that perception is purely speculative, that is wrong. And, uh, and that's, we, that's going to come up again and again. So Bergson wants to get out of this, this notion that consciousness or um, perception in this case uh, is, is something we do as like a detached observer. So we're kind of removed from the world, looking in or looking on. Um, and our principal function is to know something, is to, to observe and just to, uh, to kind of um, cognitively understand something. Uh, and that this is a theme, again, that's just all through Merleau-Ponty, right? So you can see there. And this, this whole... This whole way of interrogating the subject is also in Merleau-Ponty. Realism, idealism, and here's, um, in Merleau-Ponty's case, phenomenology. But again, you know, just the, the roots of Merleau-Ponty are just so evident here, which is cool. Uh, so let's get a definition of perception. So Bergson says, perception is the aggregate of images referred to the action of the body. That's pretty straightforward. The aggregate of images referred to the action of the body. So the aggregate of images, again, we're, we're not distinguishing between what's out there, what's in here, just there's only images. So forget about, you know, trying to trying to put those pieces together with that, that kind of dualistic framework in mind. All there are, are images, and it's just the aggregate of images. But importantly, not as... Um, a detached spectator. It's those images that concern you as an actor, as a, an engaged acting being. And so that's, that's a really critical insight here. And that, so the aggregate of images which are in perception are referred to the, sorry, the aggregate of images which we perceive are perceived in reference to the action of the body and the body is also one particular image right i see my body it's 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 nothing more than an image the same as every other image so we're, we're really kind of leveling down everything here getting away from this idea that there are mental images and external reality and you know the, the whole mix the whole mess that that kind of um inspires so just it's just all images here and that's what perception is the aggregate of those images referred to the action of the body cool okay so that that's a, a fair definition um but we can go beyond that now to, to look at how perception arises well what's what's um what gets well, let's, let's look at the, the details of how this what perception is. So we've defined it, aggregate of, aggregate of images referred to the action of the body, but, but how does this come about? How can we, can we dig a little bit deeper? And Bergson notes that it appears to depend on molecular movements, he calls it, through afferent nerves to nerve centers. So he's, he's talking about the, the scientific account of perception, right? The uh, receiving sensory inputs through our sense organs, they get converted to electrical signals, whatever, follows through 
nerves to the brain, yada, yada, yada. So that, that whole story. Um, he calls that molecular movement. So we'll, we'll, we'll run with that, that term. Um, <clears throat> so it appears, perception appears to depend on these molecular movements. But how? In what way? So the first thing to note, Bergson's not going to question that, right? This is not some kind of alternative to science or a physical description of the world. This is this is um, Bergson's not offering kind of anything anything mystical or magical or mysterious here. He doesn't um, question that that description. That would be crazy, right? To do that. I mean, well, crazy. It would be. Uh, it would just put him in the in the realms of of um, mystics and kind of new age or religion, right? So we're not gonna we're not gonna go that route. But uh, but we can we can dig a bit deeper on this idea. So these molecular movements, uh, signals transfer, um, uh, being transferred through nerves to the nerve centers, yada yada yada. But how does that create consciousness? Us create perception. Ooh, big slip there. Uh, first of all, it's not by, or second of all, right? I've already done the first one. Not by molecular movements being translated into representations. So <clears throat> the same way as, as we talked about with psychic states, <clears throat> they don't come about through... Um, anything kind of magical happening in the brain, right? The, the brain doesn't produce some kind of unextended something. Uh, that's a non-starter for Bergson. Physical states can't produce psychical states. We've seen that. And this is another way that Bergson's talk of images helps us because the body is an image. The brain is an image. And images don't create other images. So that's a uh, a nice way of kind of leveling the playing field and, and getting us out of this this um, this notion that yeah everything's material there's nothing nothing more going on in the world than, than the material this is the materialist um, position right but and yet the brain is something special some the brain does something special in some way so it's able to um, create some of these unextended phenomena through some, we don't know how, through perhaps the complexity of the brain or the the um, in, in the way that the information is integrated or, you know, these kinds of ideas. They're just, they're, they're not, they're non-starters for Bergson because, and and they should be non-starters for the materialist, right? Because if, if, a, if a physical object can do that, it's not a physical object. There's something... It's not. It's not a normal physical object, anyway, right? <clears throat> it's saying that there's there's something more to the world, something which which is able to create unextended images, which is um, is not going to fly for us. So, how do molecular these molecular movements produce perception? Not by being translated into representations, unextended representations. So let's look at these molecular movements in a bit more detail. What exactly are they? What's happening? <clears throat> well, when we have these um, signals, this, this information um, traveling through the nerves to the brain, what what is this all about? And Bergson says, this is all about my body preparing to react to external objects. And this is just an a really great insight again. Um, and it brings us back to this idea that everything's about action, it centers us in this, this notion of acting in the world. That That's what's fundamental for Bergson, not thinking about the world, but acting in it. And so these molecular movements, this, this, this whole um, sensory process, which leads to perception, which is perception, is all about my body preparing to react to external objects, preparing to react to that stimulus. Nice. And these molecular movements, they indicate the position of one privileged image in relation to the other images. 
And so that privileged image is my body, and other images are the objects around my body. <clears throat> um, so all we have here then with that is these molecular movements are nothing more and nothing less than a part of the whole of the material world. So again, just getting completely away from this idea that there's something magical happening in perception, that we're getting, we're getting some kind of unextended mental representation of the world. Um, that's going to lead us down a blind alley. These material, these molecular movements, this whole act of, of perception, the uh, the sensory process is um, it's all part of the natural world. Cool. And the consequence of this taking this position then is that there's only a difference of degree between perceptive function of the brain and reflex function of the spinal cord. So there's only a difference of degree between the perceptive function and the and our action, the reflex function of the spinal cord. So what he's saying again is that perception is grounded in action. It's a, it, it comes back to that fundamentally. We don't have to we don't have to try and explain some kind of internal representations, a model, internal model of of the world around us. Perception is fundamentally my body getting ready, preparing to act in response to these stimuli. Um, and that's what it is. It, it, there's there's nothing nothing mysterious going on here. So it's it's a nice picture that first grounds us in the world, grounds us in reality, doesn't doesn't remove us from it as a, as a detached observer. Um, and and appeals that well, it has the effect that we're no longer looking for some kind of mysterious cause of um, unextended representations in the mind. Right? We don't have to go that in that direction. So that's cool. Uh, and what we have then is that perception doesn't depend on the molecular movements; it varies with them. So perception is not something separate from those molecular movements. The molecular movements, the the um, electrical signals when they reach your brain, they don't produce something fundamentally different to them. We don't have to worry about that picture. Uh, perception is those molecular movements. So it, it doesn't depend on them. It varies with them because it's nothing. There's nothing more to the story. There's nothing more to. Um, to worry about, which is cool. So that, that that's a nice way of thinking about perception, and, and a really novel way of thinking about perception. I think that has just, like I say, been completely ignored the last hundred years. Um, so fundamentally, perception is not separate from the world, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but just just keep that in mind. Okay, let's have a look at the next section, which is called Pure Perception. All right, Pure Perception. So, um, the question that we're going to be looking at in this, this section is, why is perception conscious and how does it arise? So, we, we've kind of looked at how it arises without really taking it quite to the, to the the um, as far as we could. So we've got perception completely grounded in the natural world, right? There's nothing, there's nothing special happening. There's no production of, of unextended um, representations or anything like that. It's, it's um, centered on action. Nice. That's what we, we wanted. But we can go a bit more in a bit more detail to look at it what it means when, when we say perception arises or what perception is and importantly why perception is conscious, what that means. But first let's just have a look at this term pure perception. So concrete perception, real perception is actually a composite 
of pure perception and sensation and memory. So those two things, two extra things, are always added into um, concrete, genuine perception, real perception. Um, and sensations always added, um, the way that Bergson talks about this is real actions as opposed to virtual actions. So real actions are when, when objects affect the body. <clears throat> then the actions that, that follow from those uh, are real as opposed to virtual. That's not going to quite make a huge amount of sense just yet. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Um, but anyway, removing that element gets us closer to pure, pure perception and also memory. So memories are always a part of perception. You never just have uh, this kind of raw perception without bringing any, any memories to the table as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got this. No, I'll, I'll just quickly mention it. I've talked about memory a couple of times, just briefly, but we haven't gone into any detail. We will in a couple of videos. Um, but memory is, is added to perception in such a way that it, it lets perception take place over a certain duration. Um, and I've talked about memory as the, the engine of duration before. Right, so it's kind of what what lets those those that succession of events what lets them merge, melt into one another. Memory is is kind of how how we get there. What what the like I say the engine what drives that that process. Um, if we didn't have that, individual percepts would mean nothing. Because they wouldn't be connected to anything; they'd just be standalone um, experiences, you know, perceptions that, that don't don't connect to prior perceptions. So we'd just be living in a in, in a world of the present, which wouldn't be um, much of a world. It would just we'd just be reacting, right, with no real no sense of enduring. <clears throat> I've got a, a short quote for this. So no matter how brief we, we suppose any perception to be, it always occupies a certain duration and involves, consequently, an effort of memory which prolongs one into another a plurality of moments. And that's just exactly what I was saying. Memory, it, it, it's the engine of duration. It makes those um, plurality of moments, the, that succession of events, um, merge, melt into one another. Uh, but we're going to take it out. We need to get rid of it for this. So we're going to look at perception, pure perception, perception stripped of um, sensation and memory. So it's an abstract notion here we're looking at. Um, and normally well, we've kind of moved, shied away from dealing with abstractions. But the reason that, that Bergson does it this way is that uh, perception, kind of concrete perception blended with memory and sensation, it's, it's kind of a, a complicated, complex thing. So in order to understand what, what, what makes up this, this perception, we need to kind of pull, apart, pull the parts out a little bit, as long as we remember um, that they only make sense together, right? So that's the first thing they don't. They don't make sense on their own, so they have to they have to work together. Uh, and as long as we we keep in mind that we are we are looking at an abstraction here. So as long as as long as we're we're aware that that's what we're doing, we're not going to to make any of the mistakes that that um, typically plague us when we abstract out from from the whole picture. So we've got this idea of pure perception, <clears throat> but what makes it conscious? What makes perception conscious? Bergson says that images may be present without being represented. And the difference is conscious perception. So just, just having images that are present, um, but kind of don't mean anything. That's, that's would be like, just, just kind of, I guess, a pure 
perception but but with this this element of consciousness which is not we don't need to get worried about um, what is consciousness at this point because all he's saying is conscious perception is, is once those images mean something once they, they, they can kind of be taken up in a, in a life in a lived experience what what's that that's the difference between conscious perception and, and perhaps just brute pure perception um, so they're being represented, but how is how is this representation then different from the material object itself? So that's the next question. And we usually think conscious perception adds something to the material world. So we usually imagine our consciousness or the um, the act of perception, perceiving adding something to the material world that wasn't there originally. And usually it's it's a representation, a mental representation, right? <clears throat> so you've got the external object. Now with perception, conscious perception, we now have um, an internal representation of that, that object. So we, we imagine we're adding something to... The material world in addition to the material world but in actuality bergson says representation conscious perception is a diminishment of the material object so that's a, a beautiful idea a really great idea here conscious perception is a diminishment of the object the reality of matter consists in the totality of its elements and of their actions of every kind. Our representation of matter is the measure of our possible action upon bodies. It results from the discarding of what has no interest for our needs, or more generally, for our functions. Okay, cool. So a couple of things there. <clears throat> the reality of matter consists in the totality of its elements and of their actions. So it's matter is, is everything that's out there. But the representation of that matter, it's not something new. It's not it's not a new unextended model of, of that, that world. Rather, it's diminishing of the objects out there. How? How does how is it a diminishing? It only notices what is of interest to the body. It only notices what is of interest for our needs, for our functions. So we we discard things, aspects of the world that have no relevance for us. It's just such a great idea, right? We um, and and so true when you when you um, when you look at something you immediately see it in terms of how it relates to you, how it relates to your body. You know, when you're thirsty, you look at a cup, it, it's, it, it appears as a vessel for drinking, right? Or if you're cleaning up after, after dinner or something, then the cup, now the dirty cup, appears not as a vessel for drinking, but as something to be washed, so it's always, it always, we're always um, filtering, I guess, the the actual object itself. The cup, whether it's dirty, whether it's whether it's I've already, you know, I'm not thirsty. It's still a vessel to be to be drunk from, right? But if I'm not thirsty, it no longer has that meaning for me. I kind of filter that out. I carve that that section of, of the that meaning of the cup away and 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 focus on another aspect which has relevance to me at that moment so it, it's a diminishment of the thing perception only notices conscious perception only notices what it, what is of interest to the body and that this is the other thing external objects are arrayed around the body according to the utility that they have for me. So qualities, size, shape, color of things, 
these all modify themselves according to the distance they are from me. That is in relation to their receptivity to my immediate action. So not, not just um, specific objects that I focus on we diminish, but we also, everything around us is um, perceived in, again, in relation to my body. So if they're far away and of no concern to me or um, I'm, I'm not able to, to act on them or they're not able to act on me, I'm not concerned with them. That, or they, they, things that, that would concern me about those objects, maybe if it's a, a snake, but it's, it's you know, far away or I'm looking at, looking at it through a video camera or something, watching it on TV. So it's really far away. Um, it, 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 the danger is now gone. The snake doesn't represent a danger to me. But if I, if the snake was right in front of me, then these these different features would uh, would come to the fore. So everything around us is arrayed according to the utility that they have for me. So again, practical action. Um, but it, on the other hand, these different objects that are around me, they present to each other all of their sides at once. Such a great idea. The, uh, the cup and the, 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 the plate, if we're thinking about that, they, they, don't, hide that, they don't hide anything. Well, that's not the right word, but, but there's, nothing, there's nothing hidden from the plate to the cup if we can imagine that they have some kind of relation with each other, right? The cup appears in, in all of its bruteness to the plate and vice versa. But when I come along and look at the cup, many, th many options that the cup presents, many possibilities that the cup has for me are, are paired off because... I'm only in, I'm only interested in in what the cup can do for me, or, or how it can serve me, or how I can utilize it for something. So we 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 pair off these these irrelevant aspects of of objects um, in a way that they don't do for each other. If if we imagine that, that that they actually appeared for each other at all, but the objects in themselves they they just they for us. They, uh, we diminish their potentials, uh, and that's the important point. We've, we're taking something away from the material world rather than adding something to it in perception. So perception is conscious when it filters the images that come to it. Conscious perception signifies choice, and consciousness mainly consists in this practical discernment. I love that word there, practical discernment, and that should really make you think of Heidegger. Um, it's just it's really interesting the way that, that Bergson, a lot of Bergson, carries forward into these other later existential thinkers, right? <clears throat> Obviously Malo Ponti, but but also Heidegger quite. In this whole section, the the practical drive, the the focus of Bergson is so Heideggerian, right? That's just it's what half of being and time's about. So conscious perception, it signifies choice, a choice which may not even be, strictly speaking, conscious, right? We're not deliberately excluding these other possibilities of the objects. Um, nevertheless, there's a choice going on there. There's a, we're choosing what uh, the object will, will mean for us. That's what it is to be. A conscious perception and I thought that was interesting consciousness mainly consists in this practical discernment we'll talk more about consciousness later um, but that's kind of a hint at where where uh, consciousness is going to go for us in Bergson uh, okay so I've got a, a typical story here which just kind of illustrates this point in a bit more detail so we've got a luminous point P, or Bergson talks about a luminous point P, rays of light directed towards us, 
reflected off the object off this luminous point P um, and an unextended image is formed in the mind that's the normal picture right uh, so this is what Bergson has to say about that the disturbance after having traveled along these nervous elements after having gained the center there changes into a conscious image which is subsequently exteriorized at the point P there is not, in fact, an unextended image which forms itself in consciousness and then projects itself into P. The truth is that the point P, the rays which it emits, the retina, and the nervous elements involved, form a single whole. That the luminous point P is a part of this whole, and that it is really in P, and not, any, not elsewhere, that the image of P is formed and perceived. Boom. That's, that's the, that last part there is what we were angling at this whole video. Perception is a whole. It includes the object, the sensory system, the nervous system. Everything that's going on in there is a part of perception. It's not, it's, it's, it's bigger than what just happens in the brain. That that's the mistake that we tend to make these days, right? We think perception is something going on in here, and the stuff out there just kind of triggers it, or it, it acts as the the cause for it. Um, but the perception itself, we imagine, is happening in here, and then we we kind of project it out, project out from from our perception. We, we've got our internal model of the world, which we project out back. Um, for us to, to use in order to act. No, says Bergson, the whole thing. Perception is the whole. It includes that object. It includes the sensory system, the nervous system. All of this is what perception is. I love that idea, single whole. That's a, that's a real theme in Bergson, um, which you probably, you've already probably picked up on. Things are, things are wholes. They have to be considered as wholes. Picking them apart in order to understand them, unless you've got in mind that what you're looking at is part of a bigger whole, will give you, um, will, will send you down the wrong path. Uh, because that's what we're doing here, right? We're picking out perception from memory and, and sensation, but we're doing it with a view to the whole. So perception's a whole, okay, good. So that the first thing with that is that it's non-dualistic. This is a non-dualistic approach. Although Bergson's philosophy is not, his philosophy is dualistic, uh, it's not this kind of dualism. So he's not, there, there's nothing special, magical happening. Perception is everything that's going on here. And what that means then is that the image is actually out there in the world. That luminous point P is out there. It's not in here. It's never been in here. It never gets to be in here as well. There's only one luminous point P, and it's out there. That's the fundamental insight here. I love that idea. Anything else is magic. Any any other, when you if you try and, past this in any other way, perception, um, so that you're representing something, so that you've got a, a mental model, that's magic, it has to be seen as magic, um, that point P only exists out there, perception is not something that happens separate from that point, perception includes it, but there's only one point P, and it's out there. Perception is, is, is just like the recognition of that point P. That's what it is. But, th but there's nothing extra special. There's nothing extra being added to the world. There's only one point P. There isn't, a, there isn't a, um, an image of point P created anywhere. There's no mental representation of point P. There's no mental model of point P. There's only one point P. It's out there. When I see it, I'm still, there's still only one point P. That's the only way that this makes sense. That this, um, 
that we can avoid the the problem of dualism, which which is the problem that everybody's laboring under now, trying to explain consciousness. They've kind of um, accepted this Cartesian dualism, even though they say that they've denied it, right? Because what what else could it be if there's an unextended model of the world? I mean, how 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 much more Cartesian can you get than that? That's pure Cartesianism, right? But Bergson cuts through all of that and says, no, there's only one thing, and it's out there. When you perceive it, you're perceiving that thing. There is no extra, nothing else is being created. One way to think about this, maybe, which may, may help, is to think of like a mirror. So if, you, if there's an, an image in a mirror, being reflected in a mirror of a chair, say, um, when we look at the mirror, we see an image, okay, that, that's fine. But if you just think about the mirror itself, the mirror is not producing an image. It's not producing an image of the chair. It's not doing it. It's not adding any kind of images to the world. There's only one chair, and it's out there in the external world. It's not in the mirror. The mirror doesn't create an image. Obviously, the chair isn't in the the mirror so all the mirror is doing is is kind of receiving the light uh, the light rays that are that are, are bouncing off off the chair <clears throat> it's not adding anything to it it's not creating anything it's just um, faithfully receiving what it's what it's given right it's not it's not it's not creating anything new, any new image. There's only one chair, and it's out there in the external world. Which doesn't mean that that this is this is not saying that um, like the the what you see is is say the, the same as everybody else sees. I mean, thinking of some um, people who are colorblind, for instance, that. That that's no impediment. That's no obstacle to this to this um, to Bergson's claim here, because obviously your our um, how we perceive depends on or varies with. That was the phrase we used, right? It varies with the molecular movements. It varies with the sensory apparatus that we that we're using. Um, but still, there's nothing being created. We're not we're not adding anything. We're not creating a model. It's all we're doing is taking um, the the sensory data, and and that's it. That's all we're doing. We're taking the sensory data. If it's conscious perception, then we are we're kind of filtering it um, in in line with our actions, with our with our with our needs, with our functions, um, but we're not adding anything. We're not creating a model. That's that's the important point. But I love that idea, and it really, it really, I think it's a it's a really a deep insight that opens up quite quite a lot for us. So the image is out there in the world, nowhere else. Um, and so I, I wanted to just finish briefly talking about perception and memory. Just coming back to that. So pure perception lets us understand matter, while pure memory will let us understand spirit. So we're going to come back to that later when we talk about memory. But that's the duality for, for Bergson. Matter and memory, hence the title. Um, as opposed to um, like mind and and matter, which or consciousness and matter, which which there is a there is a difference, um, but I won't get into that just yet. Uh, complete perception, <clears throat> as we said, is is pure perception combined with those memory images. So it's person uses the word centripetal. So it's from the external object, but also centrifugal, from memory. 
So it's the, those two kind of forces work together to create what concrete real perception is. So again, just re just remembering, just just um, emphasizing that point. This pure perception that we've discussed here, conscious perception, is abstracted out from um, real perception, which includes mainly memory, but also um, sensation. Both of which we'll talk about in subsequent videos. Okay, let's have a look at a summary. So perception, um, we looked at perception as an aggregate of images referred to action. That's a nice general description, um, but we, we went into a bit more detail by looking at pure perception, which you remember is an abstraction, so it's not something that exists in the real world, concrete Perception is always a blend of memory in particular, but also sensation. So um, this was an abstraction. Again, only permissible because we're, we're, we're looking at this with a view to the whole. Right? Perception is a whole. It has to be understood as a whole. Um, but, but taking this, this, this part, this pure perception, lets us look at at um, what is important, what's an important feature, it, it clarifies things that we couldn't have clarified otherwise if we if we immediately looked at perception, including memory. So pure perception, uh, it is first. It was a whole. That was that was the first kind of big conclusion we we drew, which means that it includes the object. The, the rays, the retina, the nervous system, everything about, everything involved in that act is perception. And uh, there's, there's nothing else. That was kind of the key idea there. There's nothing being added to that. Um, the whole thing has to be understood as perception. And, and that means that it's all happening in the world, in the physical world. So again, Bergson out materializes the materialists with this. And the other conclusion from this was that the image is out there in the world. There is no other there is no other image. We're not creating images in the mind, in the brain sorry, in the brain. The brain isn't creating images for us. Um, there's only one image and it's out there. This, this was a, a really this was kind of important for me when I first read it. The images are out there. And that means that when I'm perceiving the image, my perception is literally out there in the world. And there's nowhere else for it to be, right? There's, there's nowhere else for it to be. To think anything else is, is Cartesian. It's, it's a Cartesian dualism. It's, it's the Cartesian theater, right? Um, but yeah, so images are out there. Actually, I remember thinking this with Milo Ponti too, but, um, but I don't know, there's something about the way that Bergson presented it in this, this book, which just drilled it home nicely. And we also looked at conscious perception. What makes perception conscious? And this, again, was nothing to do with um, a, a mo mental model or a, a mental images or anything. What made it conscious was the diminishment of the object so that it became meaningful. So we didn't see the object in, in all of its, we didn't see all the facets of the object. We didn't see all of the things that it could be, that it is. We saw what it is in relation to me, to my body, to my future action, how it's relevant to me. And that pairing off, that, that, um, that stripping away of those irrelevant qualities is what makes perception conscious. Nice. And that is perception for us. Uh, cool. So I hope that made some sense for you. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll catch you in the next video.